In 1936, King Edward VIII of the British royal family stepped down from the throne after ruling less than a year in order to marry an American socialite and twice divorcee. He was the first British monarch to have done this in history. The entire scandal was called the abdication crisis and the woman at the center of it, Wallace Simpson, has been fascinating to learn about. I can't wait to share everything I've learned about her with you while I draw a portrait of the infamous couple. Let's get started. Bessie Wallace Warfield is born on June 19, 1896 in Pennsylvania. She's born seven months after her parents' marriage, so it's a bit of a scandal if you do the math. Her mother, Alice Montague, and father, Teagle Wallace Warfield, came from high society families with a good name and good heritage. Her father's family, they were very stern and affluent. Not a lot of fun happening in their house. They raised their children on strict Victorian values. However, Teagle is very charming and thoughtful, although he is outshone by his older brothers. He also suffered from chronic sickness, and sickness at that time was considered a weakness. Americans really valued health and activity and outdoor exercise. Rather than trying to help him get better, his family actually ignores his poor health, and they put him to work as a clerk in a family business. This is not helping his health improve at all, and he starts at the lowest level. He hates it, but he is financially dependent on his family, so he is forced to do it. Ironically enough, Wallace's pedigree is very high, even though her name would later be dragged by the press during the abdication crisis. The Warfield family appeared frequently in British history, so Wallace is actually very high-ranking with many kings, earls, dukes, and aristocrats in her family tree, and the American history of her father's family side is equally illustrious. Alice Montague, Wallace's mother, her side of the family was old and respected and also Southern, however they had lost their money. Her family was more carefree and were kind of seen as Southern eccentrics. Alice herself was lovely, charming, and energetic. Alice and Teagle meet, they fall in love, and they want to get married, but neither set of their parents approve of this marriage, and Teagle is getting sicker and sicker. But the couple, they defy their parents, and they get hitched. No family members attend their wedding, and the couple is essentially disowned. For example, when Wallace is born, no formal announcement is made, and the birth isn't even registered. Since her father is so sick at the time of her birth, he can't even see her in person and has to request that his wife have a photograph made of the baby. Her father tragically dies of tuberculosis when Wallace is five months old. His mother, Anna Emery Warfield, takes Wallace and her mother, Alice, into her home in Baltimore, Maryland. Baltimore, Maryland was considered the South as it was below the Mason-Dixon line. Maryland was a slave state but stayed with the Union during the Civil War. I want to read more about this since there seems to be a huge divide in that state on which side to choose during the Civil War, but the Warfield set of the family was staunchly Confederate, so Wallace grew up with these traditional Southern values and the etiquette that came with it. When she moves in with her grandmother, she's introduced to domestic decoration, shopping, hostessing, and running a household. Wallace and her mother are financially dependent on the Warfields. The head of that family is her uncle Solomon. This theme of financial dependence will carry on with her later in her life. She will have to overcome social barriers and stigmas with her wit, elegance, and charm to prove that she belongs at the top, even if she isn't the wealthiest or the prettiest. Alice butts heads with the Warfields and ends up leaving that house. She would take on sewing to make income, and she always made sure that Wallace was dressed immaculately. Alice is able to convince the Warfields to at least pay for Wallace's education, and Wallace attends the prestigious Oldfields School. It's here that she dumps her first name, Bessie, saying so many cows are called Bessie. In school, she's known for being polite and considerate. She grew up in a really classy family, so she's got excellent social grace chops. She starts establishing her style and is a trendsetter in school. She'd wear a men's jacket with a long skirt, so she is establishing her style and her taste and is understanding how to stand apart from a crowd. Wallace attends the Arundel School later because Oldfields is deemed too expensive by Uncle Solomon. However, she does meet a wide range of girls from really socially prominent families, and again, she's quite popular, and she's also a good student staying near the top of her class. She isn't considered a traditional beauty, but she is striking with angular features and lavender eyes and thick, full hair. Her mother remarries a man, John Razin, and they are at last no longer financially dependent on Uncle Solomon. They are comfortable, and Razin actually pays for Wallace to attend summer camps, which she'd never been able to do before. 
Unfortunately, Razin dies abruptly in 1911, and Wallace and Alice are again left to the mercy of their wealthy Warfield relatives. Wallace leaves Arundel in 1911 and returns to Oldfields to attend finishing school. She leaves Oldfields in 1914 at the age of 18 and doesn't pursue any further education. It's time for her debut as a debutante, and it is a frenzy of engagements, dances, luncheons, and the like. Her uncle Solomon doesn't give her much money for the variety of outfits that are expected to be worn at these events, so Wallace has to be thrifty with what she spends her money on. Luckily, her mother is an awesome seamstress and can customize and repurpose anything. So this pattern of creating custom, iconic looks it kind of sticks with Wallace throughout her entire life. Wallace meets Earl W. Spencer, a.k.a. Wynn, a charming Navy pilot, and ends up getting married to him in 1916, although they had only known each other for two months. She'd be an officer's wife, but this didn't exactly match the prestige of what her schooling had prepared her for, but she's excited at the prospect of traveling to new places and experiencing new things. Side note, she actually does see Prince Edward from afar at a mayoral ball in San Diego that she and Wynn attended. Little did she know that he would be her third husband. Her husband, Wynne, turns out to be an alcoholic, and there is domestic abuse involved. He would lock her in the bathroom for hours while he disappeared to go drink. It's a really bad, fearful situation, and Wallace tries to get on with it, but eventually, being in fear for her life, she wants a divorce. Her family does not support this. They think this is going to bring shame and disgrace on their family name. She would be the family's first divorcee, and she doesn't have any financial options or support. She is forced to return to Wynn, but luckily he is commissioned as a captain of a gunboat and sent to Hong Kong. They had been living in Washington, D.C. at the time, and Wallace does not follow Wynn to Hong Kong for obvious reasons, and instead flings herself into society for distraction. It's the Roaring Twenties, so this is actually a pretty awesome time to be a socialite. Wallace is charming and witty, and she becomes very popular, and she even has an affair with the Latin American diplomat named Felipe Espiel. He is educated, refined, wealthy, and they begin to be seen regularly together. With him, she becomes even more cultured, knowing good food and wine, learning how to not be intimidated by foreign dignitaries, finding valuable pieces at antique stores and recognizing quality art, etc. She wants to marry him, but he isn't interested, so that ends. Now that this relationship is over, Wallace takes a boat to China to live with Wynne in Hong Kong to try and give her marriage another chance. They do okay for a bit, but eventually his alcoholism takes back over and things just get worse than ever before. When Wallace tells Wynne she wants a divorce, things get even worse and he would publicly humiliate her. There are rumors that he took her to brothels and made her watch. There are even some rumors saying that she was trained in sexual practices, but this is speculation that was very likely made up to slander her name during the abdication crisis. Luckily, Wallace is able to get away from Wynne by living with friends. There are rumors that come up from this time in China, which even though they are speculation, I'm going to share with you because they come up later during the abdication crisis when Wallace's name is being dragged in the mud. There's a rumor that she has an affair with a friend's husband. There's another rumor that she has an affair with a young Italian count, that she becomes pregnant and an abortion is performed that goes badly, leaving her unable to have children. But it's possible that her inability to have children could have been caused by physical abuse from when we simply don't know. Ernest is an American-born British subject. Wallace and he are both already married when they begin their affair. He wants to marry her. I think that Wallace enjoys his company, but it isn't true love. There's this quote that she writes to her mother. It says, I am very fond of him and he is kind, which will be a contrast. I can't go wandering on the rest of my life and I really feel so tired of fighting the world all alone and with no money. Also, 32 doesn't seem so young when you see all the really fresh, youthful faces one has to compete against. I kind of get it. She wants freedom from win, but she needs to be financially stable. Marriage is one of the most common things that women can do at that time to achieve that financial stability. Ernest is able to get his divorce first, and then Wallace follows suit, and they are married on July 21st, 1928, and they take up residence in England. Ernest isn't hugely wealthy, but Wallace is comfortable, and she can send her mother money that she herself is able to save. Her mother sadly dies in 1929. 
Wallace stands apart in England with her American ways. She's vivacious, she isn't stuffy, she's witty, she's charming, and she hosts the most fabulous parties. These strong hosting chops get her noticed, and she really starts to climb the social ladder. Wallace can hold a room, and she's fun to be around. Ernest moves in fashionable society, and she's also able to meet people that way too, and this ultimately helps her come across David. He is totally into the party scene too. This is the time between World War I and World War II, and it's the age of cafe society, flappers, and parties. It's art deco glamour galore with the clink of martinis and swirling smoke of cigarettes and lively music playing in the background. She meets Prince Edward, known as David by his friends, which is what we will call him from now on because his full name is Edward Albert Christian George Andrew Patrick David. I feel like his parents just couldn't settle on one name, so why not seven? Wallace meets David at a house party hosted by his then mistress. He's known as the Prince of Wales at this time. David is really popular with his subjects. In the 1920s, he did a lot of foreign press tours in the empire to represent his father, and he cared about things like low-income housing. He did these publicity tours because he wasn't allowed to serve in the army since he was the future of the monarchy, and this infuriated him. There's a quote from him saying, "'What difference does it make if I am killed? The king has three other sons.'" David is very dashing and charming and is known in the American press as arbiter of men's fashions, a fearless horseman, tireless dancer, idol of bachelors, dream of spinsters. He is definitely a womanizer and has had a series of mistresses before meeting Wallace in June 1931. She's 35 at this time and he's 37 or 38. David is struck by Wallace, and over the years, they grow closer and closer. He is a frequent visitor to she and her husband's home, perhaps too frequent. By 1934, they had become lovers, and they even go on vacations together without Ernest, putting Ernest in a terribly awkward situation. It's really obvious that Wallace and David are having an affair, but there is a gentleman's agreement in the British press that they won't write of this scandal. Many of the British population are totally unaware of this situation until David abdicates, so it's a bit of a shock. More on that to come. At first, the royal family thinks that Wallace is just another one of David's affairs, but it becomes apparent that he is very serious about her. Eventually, Ernest has to ask, hey, what are your intentions with my wife? And David says that he wants to marry her. Let it be known that Ernest is also having an affair. Ernest is essentially forced to bend to David's wishes. He has to fall on his sword, sharing his affair to make it look like he was the untrue one so that Wallace can rightfully divorce him. Years later, it was revealed that she was actually having another affair with a Ford car salesman at the same time she was having her affair with David. David never had any idea of this. David becomes king in 1936 when his father dies. Wallace's divorce from Ernest comes through following shortly after. David's family will not support the idea of his marriage to Wallace. Neither will the Church of England, and neither will the government. David's only ally is actually Winston Churchill, who was not in power at this time. Meanwhile, Wallace is totally in over her head. I think she'd been having a grand time playing mistress and would have been happy to continue doing that for however long she could. She knew that there was no way she and David could be together once he was king. He would need to marry someone suitable and also carry on the line. So remember, a lot of people had no idea of this affair because it wasn't covered in the British press. It wasn't until Bishop Blunt of Bradford criticized King Edward VIII in a speech that the abdication crisis truly began. The story had been leaked, and now the British press could report on it. And, oh, report on it, they did. This made things terrible for Wallace. She was receiving death threats. People hated her. David battles to try and find a way to marry Wallace while still being king, but no one will give him a loophole. David is forced to choose between Wallace and the throne. He decides to abdicate the throne, becoming instead the Duke of Windsor, and gives a speech to his stunned subjects, famously saying, I have found it impossible to carry the heavy burden of responsibility and to discharge my duties as king as I would wish to do without the help and support of the woman I love. There are quotes and records of Wallace trying to find alternatives to marriage, or if they do marry, to have a morganatic marriage, which would mean that neither Wallace nor uh, her children would inherit his money, title, or privileges. Edward says in his abdication speech, 
and I want you to know that the decision I have made has been mine and mine alone. This was a thing I had to judge entirely for myself. The other person most nearly concerned has tried up to the last to persuade me to take a different course. His family gives him the cold shoulder for the rest of his life. They forbid anyone from the royal family to attend David and Wallace's wedding. They snub Wallace by refusing to grant her the title of Royal Highness, even though that would technically fit with her husband's ranking. This infuriates David. He's shocked that his family is acting like this. David's sister-in-law, Elizabeth the Queen Mother, is completely furious that her husband has been forced to be king, a job that essentially kills him due to the stress that and some serious chain smoking, Bertie and Elizabeth did not want to be king and queen. Elizabeth is quoted to have said, the people who caused me the most trouble in my life were the Windsors and Adolf Hitler. This brings me to an icky part of the story that can't be glossed over. Wallace and David actually meet Hitler as guests in 1937 and are thought to have sympathized with the Nazis. Until it was changed to Windsor during World War I, the British royal family's name of saxe coburg gotha shows their strong German origins. I'm not sure of the reason for their visit, but the Germans treat Wallace really well, and she's met with royal curtsies and bows that she'd been denied elsewhere. This, of course, sits really well with David. It's actually interesting because Wallace was really involved in the war effort for England. When she and David lived in Paris, she volunteered to do supply drives, creating comfort packages for soldiers that would include, you know, socks, records, cigarettes, etc. She bought games, books, records for soldiers in hospitals. She even delivered medical supplies to field hospitals near the front in her own car. So this is a huge contrast to being a Nazi sympathizer. It's confusing. Regardless, the royal family is horrified at David and Wallace's meeting with Hitler. They suspect that David will take over the throne if the Germans win, and this is actually a legitimate fear as that was the Germans' plot, to reinstate David on the throne as a puppet king if they won the war. Wallace and David are ordered to leave Nazi-occupied Paris and go to Spain and then Portugal, which are neutral. To be super safe and prevent Wallace and David from creating any more political scandal, Churchill, who's back in power, makes them go to the Bahamas. They liken their exile here to Napoleon's exile to Elba, which honestly seems a touch dramatic as their residence is 15,000 square feet with a view of a bay and 15 bedrooms and 13 full baths. Plus, David is made governor. This is not the worst exile situation. Wallace is an active governor's wife. She takes up causes that help the people of the Bahamas. For example, she wears coral jewelry to try and promote it and make it fashionable so that that income stream can come to the island. It's said that her staff absolutely adored her, which seems super telling into the person that she was. You can usually tell someone's personality by how they treat cashiers or waiters or performers. After the war, David and Wallace travel internationally and lead this super flashy, glamorous life. Wallace is a style icon. She's a trendsetter. She's a celebrity. She's also gifted lavish jewels from David over their entire relationship. After her death, her jewels fetched over $50 million at a 1987 Sotheby's auction in Geneva. The three-ostrich plume diamond brooch of hers was designed by Edward, and it was sold for $623,000 to Elizabeth Taylor in this 1987 auction. Her engagement ring was a 19.77 carat emerald ring by Cartier. She later had it set with brilliant cut diamonds bordering the emerald. Casual. The brooch I'm drawing in this picture is also made by Cartier with carved emeralds, rubies, diamonds, and yellow gold and black enamel. The carved emerald resembles a flower with sepals and petals and gold leaves. Small diamonds circle the emerald flower, and if you're wondering what a sepal is, it's the part of the flower that's green where the stem meets the petals and holds the petals together. Take a look at this lobster dress that Wallace wore. It was actually a collaborative design between Italian designer Elsa Schiaparelli and a surrealist artist Salvador Dali. It was definitely a statement, and I actually considered drawing her in it, but opted for the couple's portrait since David is a huge part of Wallace's story. I chose to draw the couple in this perfectly color-coordinated outfit they wear in Miami in 1941. They are jet-setting in style. Wallace is wearing lavish jewelry, a perfectly tailored suit, and David is looking completely dapper. I'm also going to add in one of their dogs, Pookie. While they never had children, they were huge dog lovers and utterly spoiled them. All right, back to the story. So David thinks he will eventually be welcomed back to his country and have some kind of a role, but it 
never happens. For him, he'd been living like a king and sort of expects to continue to do so. He wants to have a large, important role and continue to live lavishly. Wallace does a pretty good job of making the living lavishly bit a possibility, and she creates kind of a glittering alternate reality, throwing these opulent parties, traveling around the world, and staying in some very bougie places. David is a very clingy husband. He had traded an entire kingdom for a woman, which is a huge amount of pressure for her to be under. He's lost his family in the process and his subjects. Wallace is all that he has. David does have a reconciliation with Elizabeth II when he's pretty much on his deathbed, dying of throat cancer. He had a ton of tubing that was keeping him alive, and he's so frail that he's urged by his doctors to stay in bed when she visits him, but he stands up to bow to her. She's moved by this and allows that he and Wallace can be buried side by side. My goodness, I know his family was still bitter about him abdicating, but the lengths they went to shun he and Wallace seem almost cruel. The fact that it was considered a magnanimous gesture of goodwill to allow him to be buried next to his wife is kind of stunning. David dies in 1972 and is buried in the Royal Burial Ground at Frogmore. Wallace's health declines in her remaining years, and she dies in 1986 and is buried next to him. What an insane love story. The scandal, the romance, the snubbing. Wallace and David's tale is one for the history books. What they did was unprecedented. Some people really sympathize with them, while others villainize. There doesn't seem to be much of a middle ground with people's opinion on Wallace Simpson. They either tend to love her or hate her, but... Hopefully learning more about her story and its ups and its downs can help us understand who she really was and understand more of the nuances of her fascinating life. I hope you enjoyed this video. I geek out about stuff like this. If you enjoyed it, please like the video. Consider subscribing to my channel. This helps me to make more videos for you. You can shop my art prints on Etsy and follow my art journey on Instagram. Stay sparkly. Mm -hmm.